Uh, today, I have a real special treat for you. We have uh, one of my best friends is here. So give her a give it up for my friend Stevens. He's going to join me up on the stage here. And uh, Stevens has been here once before, and I, I usually try and every time I introduce him, share some sort of embarrassing story. And I was kind of like, I was telling him this morning, I'm like, there's just such a list. I know. There's yeah, and so, so many I was like, from. and then I started like breaking it off into categories, like things where we broke the law together, mm -hmm. things where the police showed up. So I, I decided to go for a police story. Are you okay with that? Which so, one? Which one? Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Because uh, I could have shared the story of like, you know, because we've known each other for about 18 years. Yep. Stevens was my youth pastor. Um, in fact, I could have shared the nice story of, you know, I was 16 years old, crying in the back of the church, like, God, what do you want me to do? Where, like, what's my calling? He just, he just held there. And by the, oh, yeah, sorry, I thought I left yeah. tape on you. But anyways, and he just, you know, cried with me mm -hmm, and prayed mm -hmm. with me and journeyed with me. Could have shared that story. But that's not what you got to share. That's not what I shared. I could have shared when I had not. a mental breakdown. I shared, I told the church there were three friends. I could tell them that you were one of the friends that mm -hmm. just journeyed alongside, mm -hmm. just sat in the mm -hmm. silence, sat in the pain. But that's not what you're going to share. That's not what I'm going to share. No, 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 there was this time. I think I was about 16. We're driving up to a youth retreat in your Volkswagen Golf. Yep. Remember the Volkswagen yep. Golf? This yep. Yeah, anyways. Oh. <laughs> Do you remember that? Not the part where we drove on the lake that was frozen. Yeah, and that was, that was Not that part. Too, no, no, I, I figured I'd go with the police theme. Yes, Okay, yes, so yes. anyways, so, boop, boop, which is a common sound in our friendship, boop, boop, yeah, right? Yeah. And so we, we pull over, the cops have pulled us over, and uh, Steve's like, oh, no, I was I'm probably speeding. And so the cop comes over, and, and Stevens, classy, classy, is like, Officer, I'm so glad you pulled this over. I have these youth, these, maybe you even dropped the inner city youth. Yeah, probably, did you, did you do that? Yeah. And we're trying to go to church camp. Does that sound like yeah, something? Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. We were going And to. we're lost. Could you give us some directions? <laughs> you didn't even get a ticket, bro. No, 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 no. I did not get a ticket. I did not no. get a ticket. And you didn't even hit on the cop. No, yeah. no, no. It was just, you know, so, speaking anyway. truth. Yeah. And, and what you're probably not going to say is I was going 113 in an 80 zone, which is, you know, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. And then the following Wednesday at youth group, the two youth that I had in my car, Mark and his friend, showed up with T-shirts, um, black T-shirt bleach that says 113. <laughs> Just but, wanted to keep him humble while yes, he was preaching. Yes, 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 yes. So of course, all of you ask, oh, what's, what's that all about? And sure enough, they share the story. So yeah, Th thanks, Mark. Hey, we said we weren't going to bring it up. Yes. But yes. if people ask, we would yeah, share. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, you have to, yes. Mm -hmm. Can I pray for you before of you go? Of course you can, brother. Jesus, thanks for friendship. Thanks for brotherly love. Uh, thanks for my brother who's able to come here from the People's Church in Toronto and just share what God is doing, what he's speaking. And uh, Lord, would you open up our hearts? Thank you that we continue on in worship even as we open up your scriptures and hear your word taught, that we believe you speak to us through your spirit. And so you're welcome. You're welcome to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It's, uh, it's good to be here with you today. I, uh, last time I came, I was here this summer and I came alone. Uh, but this time I brought my family with me, my wife and my son are here. My daughter is in uh, Sunday school. Mark uh, asked me to come with my family because he wanted us to double the black population of Guelph. So here, <laughs> here we are. We brought like our whole family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see a few brothers and sisters in the crowd. Good, good to see you as well. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, so it's, 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 it's great to be here uh, with you this morning. And um, I always enjoy uh, coming where Mark is because Mark and I, as you heard, Mark and I go, go way back. And he speaks so high of this uh, congregation and what God is doing in the midst of you. So it's, it's great, to be, uh, great to be here this morning. How, how are you doing this morning? Yeah. Doing good? Yes, yes, yes. And that's often what we say, right? When somebody asks us, how are you doing? We answer good or, or fine or something like that. Uh, somebody once said that fine means I'm feeling insecure and needing encouragement. Uh, and, and that's often what we say, you know, we're good, we're good. Because basically what we want to do is kind of keep it to small talk, move on to the next conversation because you don't want to talk about, you know, how I'm really doing, you know? So we just kind of say good, 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 good. And sometimes I wonder if that's our approach with God, you know, when, when God asks us how we're doing, what's going on in our life, in our lives, we, we kind of keep it true. Yeah, we're good. We're good. It's all, it's all good. We're good. You're good. I'm, are you good? Are you, are you good, Connor? Are you you're good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all good, right? That's, that's often how we, we, we keep it uh, short. Yet, is that the reality uh, of what we're going through? Is that the reality of, of our relationship with one another and the reality of our relationship with God? I remember uh, a season of my life where things weren't good at all. It was about uh, seven or eight years ago. You see, I'm, I was born and raised in Montreal, and my wife as well was born and raised in Montreal. And if you watch hockey, last night was so disappointing. <laughs> oh, man. For, for those of you who are not hockey fans, Montreal was up 3 nothing against the Leafs. 
And then something happened, and the leaves won six three. Anyway, so um, my, my wife and I are, are, yeah, be quiet. Go Habs, go. Hey, I was alive last time uh, Montreal won a Stanley Cup. We're, 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 yeah, yes. I, hun, do you remember going downtown? Yes, yes, yes. We, we lived that moment. Many of you, uh, anyways. So uh, we're, we're from Montreal, and we, uh, every Christmas we go back to see the family, and you know, the grandkids want to see their cousins, and the grandparents, and get spoiled, and all that kind of stuff. So we went to Montreal, had a great time. And we, uh, we were on our way back. And I, as we got back, my wife and my mom called and said, you know, brother's not doing too well. I'm like, okay, as I was driving back then, it was legal. Send him a quick text. Hey, I hope you're okay. Praying for you. Um, <clears throat> and then that night, we got, to Munch, uh, we got back to Toronto. And uh, I had a hockey game. So I went to my hockey game. And on my way out of my hockey game, my aunt sent me a text. She's like, give me a call. And in those days, my aunt didn't text me quite often, so uh, we're on the highway. I was on the highway, 401 in Leslie, if you know Toronto, by the IKEA there. And as soon as I called my, uh, my aunt, my aunt says, oh, your, your brother's gone. Like, oh, where, where'd they go? Did he go to the hospital? Because my mom, mom said that he wasn't feeling well. And she's like, no, no, your, your brother's gone. And just like that, on December 27th, uh, 2001, I lost my only sibling. My brother, uh, at the time, was 36 he had a pulmonary embolism, which is a, a blood clot in his lungs. Um, and just like that, he was gone. I left his daughter, who was not even a year old, and his son, who was a, a five-year-old, and, and wife, and, and everybody else. And I remember j- j- during that season, I was like, God, like, what the heck is going on? Like, what, what, what is happening? Why is, uh, uh, why is this happening? And if we're honest with ourselves, we all go through seasons where we, we want to ask God, like, God, like, what, why, what's happening here? What, why is this happening? Whether it's a financial crisis, whether it's somebody losing their job as their brother shared early on, whether it's family relationships that are strained, we all go through seasons where we're like, God, like, what is going on? And a quick look at the book of Psalms teaches us that we can connect with God in such times. You know, often we're not sure if we can go to God, if we can talk to him. But the book of Psalms is there to show us that, no, we can connect with God. Our text for today is Psalm 13. If you have your Bible, we'll get there in a few seconds. You can turn to Psalm 13. You see, Psalm 13, it says stuff, it, it teaches stuff. It's, it's, it's a psalm of lament, and a psalm of lament, there are many of them in the, uh, in the Bible, and it, it teaches how we can talk to God in a way that it's raw, in a way that it's open, and, and sometimes it asks questions that we're not sure that we should be asking God. You know, it, it kind of like, ooh, David, did you say that? If we read in Psalm 10, verse 1, Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 42, verse 9. Why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? Psalm 88, verse 13 and 14. I cry to you for help, O Lord. Why do you reject me and hide your face from me? See, when we read, when I read Psalms like that, it goes against what I was raised. Because you see, I was raised not to ask God any questions. You know, God's a big man. He, you know, whatever he says, you have to do. And you don't ask any sort of authority, let alone God, any questions. So when I read this, part of me wants to ask, wants to tell David, David, come on, man, you're, you're more than conqueror. Don't you know that he who's new is bigger than he who's in the world? And, you know, we, we want to say those quick things to kind of fix a David up. Shake it off, David. Yet the reality is uh, such psalms are, they they get in touch with the pain that many of us endure uh, deep within it. It it engages this part of us and and it teaches us that it's okay to connect with God. It's okay to engage with God. The the, the book of Psalms was was a songbook for the people of Israel. It's inspired by God's word and therefore it teaches us how to lament and to pray our pains, which is the title of the message today, How to Pray Your Pain. So if you have your Bible, let's uh, look in the book of Psalms, uh, and we will read Psalm 13. Psalm is right in the middle of your Bible, maybe a little bit to the left. So I'll read for you Psalm 13. If you don't have a Bible, you could pick one up, I think, or it'll be on the screen right behind me. So let me read for you Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. 
and my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Let's pray. Father, as we dive into your word, I pray that you will guide us and show us how it's, it's okay for us to be raw and be open with you, and that you actually want to meet us there. I thank and I praise you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, amen. See, as, as we uh, look at this psalm, we see that uh, David pours his heart to God, he uh, pleads with God, and he praises God. Okay, he pours uh, his heart to God, he uh, pleads with God, and ends by uh, praising God. And I'm not even uh, trying to say that when you go through hard times, this is a sequence, not, not at all, but you, you, you'll see uh, as, as, we, uh, as we go along. So David begins by pouring his heart to God. He says, how long, O Lord? How long? We're not exactly exactly sure what's going on in the life of David here. Maybe he's being pursued by King Saul. Maybe things are not going well with his family. Uh, Maybe he was anointed king and he's not there yet. We're not exactly sure uh, what's happening. Maybe he's got some some tensions with his brother. We're not exactly sure. But one thing that's for sure is that it's been happening for a long time. And he's asking, God, how long? Because I don't know about you, but one of the things that we want to know when we're going through our times, is one, we want the answer to two questions, why and how long? And if we could figure out those two questions, we could kind of get our bearings, right? If, if it's one week, two weeks, a month, a year, okay, you know, if, if it's a year, I could somewhat uh, brace myself. But we, we want to know the answers to these questions. And throughout the Bible, we see this theme of waiting. The Bible tells that Abraham waited 25 years before he was able to get his son. His son Isaac waited 20 years before he could have children. Joseph was 13 years in prison before he ascended to the throne. Moses waited 80 years before he could deliver the people of Israel. I mean, this this theme of waiting is all throughout the Bible. and, And often it feels like God's delay is God's denial which is not necessarily the case. David continues by asking, by saying, will you forget me forever? See, all throughout the Bible, when God remembers, he acts. It's not as if like God is going on the walk and, oh yeah, right, I forgot, I, I forgot, now I remember what seems I'm about to do something. No, no, when God, it's a, it's a human language to say that when God remembers, he's about to do something. Uh, God remembered Noah, therefore he dried up the water. He remembered Abraham, therefore he rescued Lot. He remembered Rachel, therefore he opened her wombs. He remembered Moses, uh, therefore he rescued him from his enemies. So the idea of there, is that when God is uh, remember, he, he remembers he's about to intervene, he's about to do something. So if David is saying, you know, like, will you forget me forever? What David is saying is, no, God, sounds like God is asleep. He's not doing much. He's not acting in my life. Where the heck is God? Sounds like he's taking a nice little nap. I, I, I don't know about you, but I grew up watching WWF wrestling. Yeah, anybody grew up, I see, uh, yes, I hear that, I I see those hands, yes. I grew up watching WWF wrestling, and in my household, it was like Sunday was church, Saturday was WWF, okay? Like, it was like a non-negotiable, uh, and now it's WWE, it's entertainment, it's like, it's, like it's, it's crap now, but back then, it was the real deal, it was all real, right? And even, like, when we were kids, my dad used to take us, when they came through Montreal, my dad used to take us to WrestleMania, so we'd actually go see it live. It was amazing. So w- w- one of the things that would happen, one of the uh, positions that he would do is, it's called the sleeper hole or, or the rear naked choke, whatever uh, sports UFC fan you're, you're into. And what would happen is this, the uh, wrestler, in this case, Hulk Hogan, an ultimate warrior, they would kind of choke him from behind. And surely enough, in this case, the ultimate warrior was someone to fall asleep. And the rule was this. The, the referee would take the hand and drop it. If the hand dropped three times, it was done, game over, this guy is asleep. And usually what would happen was like this. It would go up once, and down, right? Twice, down. Then we're getting the tension. It's mounting. The music is playing, and people are freaking out. It goes th- third time, and it goes down like, no, no, no. And then he would get a resurgence of energy, and he would wake up, and boom, and boom, and throw on the rope, and boom, and throw on the ground, and one, two, keep on. He get all excited, the crowd goes wild and everything, right? And what David is saying is, that's not happening with God. Because it seems that God's hands goes once, twice, three times, and God is just fast asleep. God is nowhere to be found in his life. 
And that's often when we ask God, God, what about me? God, like, wh- how come you're not active in my life? How come I've lost my job? How come they got a promotion and I've lost my job? How come they, they, they got a boyfriend or a girlfriend and I'm still single? God, what about me? How come they got a new car and I'm stuck taking the bus? God, what about me? Like, have you forgotten about me? How come they can have kids and we've been trying for a year and going through all sorts of of measures to try to have kids and it's not happening? How come their kids are walking with the Lord and mind having God? What about me? And David continues by asking, how long will you hide your face from me? How long will you hide your face from me? See, uh, God's face, biblically speaking, God's face is a symbol of God's blessing. Before the service, a brother was uh, praying with us, Brother Jim, I believe is his name, was praying with us, and he quoted this verse from Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. This is what, uh, when Aaron wanted to bless his people, this is what he says in Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So you see, God's face is a symbol of God's a blessing, a God's blessing. So if God is hiding from David, what David is saying is, man, I feel like I'm cursed. Everything is falling apart. Everything that I'm touching is breaking. Like nothing is going for me. I mean, you're playing hide and go see God and you're the one hiding right now and I can't seem to find you. This is not fun anymore. See, let's get our facts straight. David knows in his mind that God is, you know, omnipresent. He's everywhere. That God is omnipotent. He's all, like, David knows his theology. But when we're going through times like this, sometimes we say stuff that, ref- that reflect how we feel, but may not necessarily reflect our beliefs. I know you went through a, a series when Mark showed you know, how your emotions affect your belief and, and everything. And sometimes what we say is a reflection of, of what we believe. But sometimes they're just things that we say. You know, when we're going through times like this, we, we may say, man, where the heck is God? Like, God is nowhere to be found. Maybe the, the, it's not worth going on. Like, I'm, I'm just done. We say things like that because those things reflect how we feel. And this is what Job is saying in Job 6, verse 26. Do you think that you you can reprove words when the speech of the despairing man is wind? You see, we say things like that, but they're just words for the wind. The wind will come, we'll take those words. I mean, this, don't like do your whole theological thesis on how I'm feeling. No, those are just words that I'm saying. Yet often when we say these things, we've got some well-meaning brothers and sisters that make it their task to take us to Sunday school and want to correct every single one of our belief system, every single one of our emotions that seem to be out of whack. See, when, when, when David, when, yeah, when, da- when Job was going through a hard time, the best thing that his friends did was coming and they sat with him for a week and they didn't say a word. And as soon as they opened their mouth, things went downhill from there. You know, when we're going through times like these, often we've got well-meaning people that will say, you know, like, everything happens for a reason. Really? Do you know that reason? Will will I ever know that reason? I don't know. It'll say things like, God must have something amazing in store for you. Really? I mean, tell John the Baptist that, right? When he was in prison and waiting for something amazing, what happened to him, his head got chopped off. And I'm not saying those things are not true, but let's not um, minimize our brothers and sisters' pain by saying things like that. You know, are you, are you reading your Bible? No, you know, I, I'm not. Have you tried praying? Oh, that's a great idea. You know, may, maybe you have sin in you. We, we all say things like that. We, don't get me wrong. We mean well. But sometimes the best thing to do is just not to say anything and just to be present. I remember uh, before we had, we had our, our son, uh, Jaden, we had, my wife and I had a miscarriage, and we're going through all the, the emotions that that uh, brings along. And, and again, a well-meaning brother and sister, you know, and say, no, that was just a trial run. You know, you'll get it right the next time. Really? When my, my, my brother passed away, again, well-meaning people, you know, God needed another angel in heaven. 
Oh, come on. He can get tons of me. Why did it have to be married? Like, we mean well, but friends, often the best thing to do is to be quiet and to be present. Don't feel like you have to say something. You may feel uncomfortable, but just be present. Because often the things that we try to say do not necessarily help. When people share from a, a deep a place of pain, let's use discernment as we respond to them. David's lament intensifies, overcome with doubt. He cries out, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts? You know, sometimes when you're sick, you, you can't find like a right position. You're trying to fall asleep and you're sweating. You just, you know, like you, you can't find the right position to sleep. The, David, that's what seems to be uh, happening in David and stuff. Like, what's going on here? Like, how come I, I, I'm alone? And why isn't God doing it? Maybe it's, it's my fault. Like, what happened? But I did pray. I do have faith. Maybe I don't have enough faith. If I had more faith, maybe it's because it's, it's I sinned. You're right. I did sin. Man, I'm so stupid. Like all those things are happening in David's heart and he's wrestling with his heart. And it's not just some sort of intellectual wrestling that's happening because he continues by saying, and day after day have a sorrow in my heart. What David seems to be describing here is borderline depression that he's going through. Like just a, a sense of heaviness day after day. Some of you may know a gentleman by the name of Thomas Dorsey. He is known to be the father of gospel music. Back in the early, early in the 20th century, he had a very successful jazz career, and everything was going well. And at one point, his life fell apart, and as often it happens, he turned to Jesus, gave his life to Jesus, and things seemed to have picked up again. He was a devoted follower of Christ and started to, to be involved in ministry, using all his talent and his musical gift for God's glory. And he lived in Chicago at, uh, uh, at the time, and he had a series of meetings that he had to go play in St. Louis. So he gets up in the morning, kisses his wife goodbye, um, goes to play in St. Louis, and as he gets off the stage that night, he gets a, a, a note that's given to him, and the note said, your wife is dead. So he rushes back home in Chicago, uh, and he's at the hospital, and, and, and as he's at the hospital, what they didn't tell him is that just before he, she died, she had actually given birth to a son. So now he's caught up in the mix of, of this grief and, and, and joy, and, and, and friends, that's often how life is, right? We, in the mixture of, of grief and, and joy, and this is exactly where he's at. But that very night, his son also passed away. So Thomas Dorsey ended up burying his son and his wife in the same casket. And this is the kind of, of, of sorrow of heart that David must have been feeling. You see, and, and as I look at this room, I, I must think that many of us have some sort of a, a deep a sorrow of heart. I mean, we, we come here uh, to worship, and, and sometimes we, we feel that we have to put like a, a happy face on and just start worshiping God, but we don't even feel like worshiping. I mean, you don't even want to be in church, and maybe actually you didn't come to church. Maybe you're, you're watching online right now, like, oh, I don't want to go to church today because your heart is so heavy. The final blow in David's situation is that his enemy seems to have the upper hand on him. He continues by saying, how long will my enemy, my enemy be a triumph over me? And this is often the reality that we see in the Bible in David's life, that there's a triangle that seems to happen between David, his enemies, and God, and there's, there's, they're often intertwined. Maybe the root of his sorrow is that God seems to have forgot, forgotten about him. Therefore, his heart is full of anxiety and, and worry. And his enemy now seems to have uh, the, the upper hand. And if you think that uh, David is abnormal, we're, we're talking about the man after God's own heart here, right? We're talking about like David, the, the giant slayer, the, the shepherd of Israel. Like this is who we're talking about here. Despite that, he does not cover up his pain. And neither should we. Because look, look, look at what's happening here. This is what David said. He says, yes, God forgets about me. God seems to hide his face from me. I'm resting with my thought. I've got sorrow in my heart. And my enemy seems to have the upper hand. But what is he doing on that? Is he just like crying? No, no, no. He is still going to God with his pain. 
Right? He's still going in God's presence with everything that's going on in his life. He doesn't just like cry out. No, no. He goes to God. And how do you do that? What does that look like in these days? Is you look in the face of Jesus and you cry out to him. You want to know what God looks like? Look at the face of Jesus. He's a big man. He can handle it. Throughout the Bible, we see people that have taken this step of, of praying their pain, whether it's, it's Moses or Job or Isaiah. The Bible is full of examples of people that have cried, that have prayed their pain. And ultimately, Jesus did the exact same thing. Right? When he was in, in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, you don't think that he was crying out to God? The night, before he, the night before he was betrayed, he is in the garden and sweating, blood, crying. If it's possible, could you take the, this away from this cup away from me? As he's on the cross, he actually gets his cue from David and quotes Psalm 22. My God, my God, what are you forsaking me? What is Jesus doing? He is praying his pain. Jesus models to us what it's like to pray our pain and gives us the freedom to do so. And because he has done so, because he gives us uh, the freedom to do so, we can do so. And this is what the author of the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews uh, chapter 4. And this is what he says, Therefore, since we have a, a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we, do not high, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. See, whether, let me pause you for two seconds. Whether you are a follower of Christ or not, one thing that you and I have in common is like when we're going through some hard times, we want somebody that, that can journey with us, with us, somebody that can understand, somebody that can relate, somebody that, that, that we we can have this connection with because no I don't know many people who would like to suffer alone and what the author is saying here is Jesus gets it he understands he has gone through pain he was crucified he was abandoned he was rejected he gets it therefore we can go to him he can relate he continues by saying but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are because reality is, as we're going through pain, I don't know about you, but I know when I'm going through hard times, I'm tempted to, to, to say things that I probably shouldn't say, to watch things that I probably shouldn't watch. I'm fairly vulnerable. And what the author is saying here is, Jesus has been tempting in every way, yet without sin. Let us then approach Approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our uh, time of need. Because I don't know about you, but when I'm going uh, a few hard times, I, I, I say things I probably shouldn't say. I think thoughts that I probably shouldn't think. Therefore, I need God's mercy. I need God's grace. And the author of C say, yes, come to Jesus. Actually, come boldly to Jesus because he can handle it. He's a big man. He can take it. And it says if uh, David heard this, because it's in, in verse 3, it's as if he's, he's taking God by the calling. and says, look on me and answer. Instead of, of running away, instead of, of turning your face away from me, no, no, look on me and answer. Lord, my God. He's talking about this covenant God, this God who made a covenant, who made an alliance with his people, who said that I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. This is whom he's talking to. Therefore, he's saying, you know, since you said that you will never leave me, nor forsake me, look at me and you are not only the God of my mother and my father and of Jacob and of Abraham and of Isaac and, of, and the God of my mommy and no no but you are my God look at me and answer give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death see often we uh, can tell we can judge how somebody is doing by looking at their eyes right somebody once says the wind the eyes are the windows of the soul when you, you look at this set of eyes here, you, you can tell that this person is hurting, right? I think it's fairly safe to assume that this person right there is hurting. And maybe what David is saying is like, God, physically, I'm hurting. I'm just, uh, I'm not doing well. Please revive my body. That's potentially what David is saying. But I think more than that, more than physical healing, I believe that David is asking for a new set of eyes. He's asking for, for perspective. He's asking God, can, can I see things from your perspective? 
Because friends, as we're going, when we're in the midst of our pain, often we, we want our situations to change. We want God to change everything that's happening around us. But what we truly need is a new set of eyes. It's to see things from God's perspective. I was talking to a friend this weekend. She has seven kids, which is crazy. And you know, seven kids. And she, she was telling, that, she telling me that at some point, you know, she, I mean, it's, it's hard when you have seven. I've got two and that's a handful. You know, my wife, like, like divide and conquer. You take one, I take one. We can do it. seven kids. Eee. You know, and, and she was telling me there were times where she's asking God, God, like, I want to kill one of them. You know, do something. And as she was praying this with God, because she was sensing that she was getting sometimes better even. And what she's, she, as she was uh, telling me that story, she said, but then like God changed her heart. God changed her heart so that she could see her kids the way God sees them. And her whole demeanor, her whole uh, countenance changed. And, and often that's what we need. When you are in the midst of, of situations, we need God's perspective. We need a, a fresh light. And let me ask you this. What are different ways that God can give us perspective in our situations? What are, how can God give us light or perspective in what we're going through? Okay, um, when I ask a question, I expect an answer, okay? So, so, so work with me here, okay? Well, what are some different ways, let me just, maybe that, that oh, that's what it was. Okay, guys, I'll put it aside. So what, what are some different ways that God can give us perspective as we're going through seasons of pain? Talk to me. Through his spirit, yes. His spirit that leads us into all truth. Truth about ourselves, truth about who he is, and truth about our circumstances. Because often when we're in the midst of pain, our perspective is skewed and we, we assign to God stuff that the enemy is doing. So yeah, his spirit will lead us into our truth. Totally, yes. What are some other ways? His word, yes. Right? As we, somebody said Psalm, as we read his word, we, we, we see the truth about what's happening. We see that, you know, there are other people that are going through situations that we can talk to them, that we can connect with them, that I don't need to keep it all in. Yes, totally through his words. What are some other ways? Prayer, yes. Yes, as we, as we pray and connect with God, there's a heart to heart connection that happens. We'll talk about that in two seconds. Totally. What are some other ways? Meditate, yes. You, you, you still, you be still, Psalm 46, then you, you be still and you know that I am God, that God is over all our, my circumstances, over everything that I'm going through as I connect with him and, and take the time to, to take this word because reality is we're so bombarded by everything else that's happened in our lives, right? Whether it's, it's social media, we, we spend so much time in all these things that we don't spend a whole lot of time to meditate and to allow God's word to transform. Yes, what are some other ways? Community, yes, thank you so much. Through people. How often that like, you've been going through something and you, you share with, with a good friend or, or, or a brother or a sister and they either say something or better yet, they ask a question that totally gives you perspective on what you're going through. And that is all true, friends. Those are all, and there's probably many more, probably go on there. Those are all different ways that God gives light to what we're uh, going through. You see, when we are, 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 are going through uh, those things, we, we need uh, God's perspective. We, we've all been in relationships where there's something that stands between uh, us and the other person. If, if you're married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, there, there's something that's uh, there. And you actually need to put it on the table and, and wrestle with it. Right, because if you uh, put it under the rug, you just it's a matter of time before you trip on it, and it grows, it grows, and it grows. I see that head that's nodding. Right, I mean this is what happens, and it's very similar in no relationship with God. Unless we take the time to actually be open and honest with God, the things that are there, they're, they're just gonna fester. I shared with you uh, early on when uh, my brother uh, passed away. When uh, my brother passed away, I actually. I, we were in Montreal, we went back to Montreal for the funeral and then my family came back here and I stayed uh, 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 a little bit longer in Montreal and I took the, tr the bus back to Toronto. It's roughly like a five and a half uh, hour ride and friends, the first probably two or three hours, I just lost it. I was a mess in this bus because I mean, Joel, if you know, you're trying to you know, stay strong and <laughs> but I, I, was, I just lost it. You know, the, the ugly kind of crazy, like that. It was just like awful. 
And then we got to Kingston, and when uh, uh, we got to Kingston, I, I pulled out my journal. This is one of my, my old journal. Um, I pulled out my journal, and I thought, okay, God, I mean, this thing is there, and yes, I know all these things in my head, but bro, like there's th- this, that ain't right. And, and I started writing down. Let me give you a picture of, um, uh, of what I wrote down. I was asking God, God, do you understand? Like, really, do you understand? Like, I'm still, I'm still trying to unravel how I'm doing and how I'm feeling, but do you understand? Like, why did my brother have to go at such a young age, weeks before his daughter's first birthday? Why did he have to go like that? Why, did he, why didn't he receive the last, last text that I sent him, telling him that I was praying for him? Why did they bring him back to life six times? Why not another time? Why will my nephew grow up without his father? And why, did, why uh, didn't my niece know how amazing her dad was? Why will my sister-in-law have to go on without my brother? How will she handle it? She's so nostalgic lately, and I don't even know how much, uh, uh, I don't even know how much uh, this, is, uh, whole, this whole thing is helping her. Why did my mom have to lose her firstborn son? Why did he have to go? Who will help my sister-in-law raise her two kids? Will they ever understand how amazing their dad was? Who will comfort my sister-in-law? Who? Will she ever turn to you? Father, I, I, I don't know, man. This is not looking good. Does it look like you're in control? From the outside looking in, it feels like you didn't see this one coming. Yes, I know in my head that you're in control, and I fully believe in your sovereignty, but, but man... And friends, I mean, this is just part of, of, of what I said. And I just like, ah. and, and And I can tell you that as that happened, as you pray your pain, as you connect with God, and you, you unravel things that happen, there's, there's a heart-to-heart connections that happen with the heart of God. You know, I've, I've been going, actually this week I got word that my grandma passed away um, in Hayden. If you watch the news, you know how things are not going too well in Hayden. My mom is trying to get the body uh, back to Montreal and it's just a huge mess. And I was talking to one of my good friends and, he, and I was telling him, yeah, you know, it's, it's all good, man. It's all good. He's like, no, it's not all good. And, and I had to, I was like, he's right. It's not all good. And often we, we, we try to pretend that it's all good, even when it's not. But as we lay it all out to God, as we pray our pain, as we bring it out on the table, friends, there's a, there's a heart-to-heart connections that happens with God. The experience is universal. Like, I don't know how long it'll take, and I'm not saying that, you know, if, if you pray and you plead, boom, you know, all of a sudden, pray. No, I don't know how and how long it'll take, but there's a heart-to-heart connection that happens. The, the penny will drop, and, uh, and right there and then you start to see things from God's perspective. The experience is, is personal, it's, it's universal, but what that looks like is so personal. Will the circumstance change? Maybe not, but your way of looking at it will. I remember a couple of years ago, my, my son and I went for a run. And we uh, went for a run, and as we're uh, running, it was, it was water on the ground, it was a little bit slippery, and he slipped and fell right in front of me. And as I was running, I was trying to avoid like stepping, run his head, so I kind of put my leg on the side, but I stepped on his arm, which caused his, actually on his shoulder, which caused his head to like bang right against the concrete. And as I looked around, picked him up, he had this big gashing wound on his cheek. He still had a little bit of a scar on it. I'm so sorry, bro. You, you okay? You good? Okay. Yeah, a big gashing wound coming out um, uh, of his face. And as I saw him, he was crying and weeping in the middle of the street, all sweaty. And, and, and I take him, and, and I hold him in my arms. And as I hold him in my arms, he, he stopped crying. Now let me ask you this. Did the pain go away? No. Did any circumstance change? Not. Did he stop bleeding as soon as the hell him are? Not at all. But there was something that happened right there and then. There was a hard connection that was created right there and then. See, often we, when we're going through things like that, we're, we're asking God to, to change our, our circumstances. Yet, what we truly need is to be comforted by God. See, and it's, it's after we've, we've poured our hearts that, and, and plead, we pleaded with God that praise will arise. And this is what David says 
in verse, uh, in verse five, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. You see, the, the heart that was full of sorrow is now a heart that is full of praise because he knows that God will save him. He knows that this God who saved him from the lion, who saved him from Goliath, who saved him from his brothers, he knows that that same God that was with him then is with him now. And he says, I will sing of the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Early on, I, I talked to you about uh, Thomas Dorsey, and I shared with you how him, his, his, wife and his, his wife and his son passed away. And when that happened, he went through a season where he was just angry and just lost it. Yet he took the time to, 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 to pray. He took the time to, to, to pour out his heart and, and to plead with God. And, and at one point, one of his friends uh, took him by the hand and brought him to a piano. And as he, I mean, I journal, he's a musician, he plays music. And as he laid his hands on this piano, there was a song that rose up. And some of you may know this song. And if you know this song, uh, sing it with me. It goes like this. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me home. This heart-to-heart connection happened. And this is what he was able to write. He later wrote, I learned that when we are in the deepest grief, when we feel the furthest from God, this is when he is the closest and when we are most open to his restoring power. So friends, I'm not sure what you're going through this morning. Maybe it's some relational issue. Maybe you're, you're waiting for the result from, from tests. Maybe uh, it's a financial crisis. Maybe I, I'm not exactly sure what you're going through. But my prayer is that as we move forward from here, that you will learn to pray your pain. It's okay. God is a big man. He can handle it. That you will, uh, you will pour out your heart to God. That you will uh, plead with God. And at some point, I can't exactly tell you when, it's not a, maybe a matter of weeks, it may be a matter of months, it may be a matter of years, but a song will arise. May I encourage you actually to write out your own psalm of lament. Take your time and just pour out your heart to God and allow him to meet you at your deepest point of need. Let us pray. Father, we, we come before you and, and we thank you that you are a God who welcomes us. The good, the bad, the ugly, all of who we are. You take us in just as we are. And you don't want us to fake it. You don't want us to pretend. You don't want us to say that we're fine. You want us to be real and raw so that we can be intimate with you and allow you to meet with us at our deepest point of needs. So brother, I I pray for myself. I pray for my brothers and sisters here. But as a result of what we've heard today, we will learn to pray our pain. I thank and I praise you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, amen. Well, before you head out, just one, I want to just thank Stevens and his family and our whole band just in leading us into the presence of God. And we just, um, yeah. I love that Lakeside isn't a place where we talk about a God who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, but that we can encounter him today. And as I've been preparing in the next few series, this is what we're going to be talking about. So just so excited for what God has for Lakeside. Uh, before I give you the benediction, I want to remind you our prayer teams are going to be up front. I tell you all the time, prayer is something you can be selfish for. If it's offered, just take it, okay? Whatever your need, doesn't matter if it's an ingrown toenail, we'll pray for it, okay? Or anything. Um, But with that said, uh, it's really neat. The way the schedule worked out and everything, I wasn't speaking for the last three weeks. And so they're like, so is it a series? Uh, I'm like, no, it's just gonna be three different speakers. It's gonna be one-offs, but God will take care of it. Can I just walk you through what God did in the last three weeks? First, Daniel came up and told us that there are things that we need to let go of. Then Janet talked about what do we need? That sometimes we can't, and then she even said, we can't get what we need unless there's things we're actually willing to let go of because you can't take when you're still holding on to something. 
And then this morning we sang about breakthrough. And then Stephen's told us that sometimes it's the thing that we hold on to that we don't want to give to God that holds us back for his presence. And in that song that Matt just led us in, it said, in my weakness, your glory appears. Can I bless you? That you be people who bring everything to God. You don't hold on to anything. You bring it to him in whatever form it is, raw, angry, whatever. Because as he said, it's that thing that we keep tripping over. It's the thing that's blocking our relationship with God. It's the thing that's stopping us from encountering his full presence. It's the thing that's leaving us on the floor bleeding when our father just wants to take us in his arms. But because we've left that in between us, we're not willing to get in. May I just bless you to walk in freedom this week that whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is you're holding on to, would you let it go? And would you give it to him? Can't wait to see you next week. It's Vision Sunday. And until then, just pray that his presence goes with you wherever you go. In Jesus' name. Amen.